Hi, this is Privateer Station, and uh, this is an interview between Alex Aristovich and Yulia Latinina recorded on uh, the 14th of February, a day before we learned about death of Alexei Navalny. So there is no mention of him in this conversation, but uh, I think the questions that they brought up about who are Russians are rather valid and ring true. As always, special thanks to our members and supporters. Today they go to Topia SR and John Afseth. Thank you guys for sticking with us. With your help, it makes it easier to produce these videos. And with this, let's deep dive into day 722. Who are Russians? Enjoy. Good day, dear sirs. It's uh, Yulia Latinina and Alexei Aristovich. A little bit before we start, we were listening to Putin's interview, and we came to agreement that we do not share the common opinion about worthless grams. It actually presents a very coherent picture, same as uh, an Islamist, a terrorist, or a crazed left leftist would uh, keep in his mind. This is my opinion, I'm not imposing it on anybody else, but we cannot giggle listening at his statements. It's as if giggling while reading Mein Kampf, or giggling when Palestinians are telling that in 1948 it was their land. LOL, how silly they are. No, this is not the right attitude. With this, let's uh, give a mic to Alexei. I remind to don't forget um, to subscribe to our channel, to Alexei's channel, and of course to the privateer station if you're listening or watching that in English. Don't forget to click that like button while you're at it. Alexei, we also we will talk about uh, the previously mentioned topic. What is Rus? What is Russia? Rus, right. I did promise to talk about what are Russians. Okay, first. In my opinion, Russians are principally non-ethnical category. I consider Russians to be a separate type of civilization that has a very core in its uh, Orthodox Christianity, of the Eastern type of Orthodox Christianity, that had a big influence on it. And the sacred core of its uh, vision of the world is constituted of truth and conscience. As you understand, I said a while ago that if there were enough Russians on both sides of the border, there would not be a war. Because we would not even have thought about fighting for what we're fighting for in the ways we're doing it now. But since there are not enough Russians on both sides between Russians, on the Russian Federation side and on the side of Ukraine, that's why we have the mutual decimation. All right. Do we continue with Russians or do we switch to Putin's interview here? As you wish, Yulia. You're the host. I'm just answering your questions here. All right. Let's then to exercise a little, to warm up, uh, look at the Putin's interview, since we did announce that we will talk about him too. And I would say, name me, and I'll use your quote here, name me one government that is not relying on mythology and on different interpretations of... Right, I would like to listen about any ideology that has no rooting in uh, a myth behind it. And this mythology is not relying on highlighting certain facts and hiding others. And personally, I do not appreciate that kind of ideology and mythology, myth-making, and that's why I can probably highlight the weaknesses of his interview, if you want. Sure, we'll go ahead. Uh, his weakness is that he is hiding, seriously hiding, uncomfortable, moments of Russian history, or if we want to say joint history, that lasted well in LA for about 800 years that we had a joint history. From the mo If to count from the moment when Kiev was ransacked by Andrei the God-loving, Andrei Bogolubsky, in Ukraine we consider that to be a point of separation, but uh, for Russia that's a point of coexistence, right? And it would be better if he if we're playing devil's advocate here and playing his role, if they want to present it as the civil war within one country or a conflict 
between Kiev and Moscow, he could have said that there were a lot of uncomfortable moments in history between Kiev and Moscow, and he could have listed the main questions from Kiev to Moscow, to Kremlin, and he could have answered those questions. I don't even suppose how, but if he did so, that would be an honest discussion in this case, and that interview would have been much braver and uh, would have influence not only on those fringes uh, on the Trump supporting side who now praise Putin, but also on a lot more people. So he has a problem though. He always swings for a dollar and hits for a cent. He presents meta-historic pretense about restructure of the Holy Russia, a big Russia or Rus, or Russian Federation. But, but at the same time, the person who sets the plank at the Catherine the Great or Peter the Great level, he is shy. He is shying away from mentioning important and very legible pain points that were important for several centuries and will continue to be. For example, starving of Ukraine, Golodomor, Voluev's order about repressions to Ukrainian language. We can go today over the points that Timothy Snyder brought up, since Ukraine failed to bring its own defender. We can go over his article and say what Putin could have said in this regard. I'll be in my favorite role of devil's advocate and let's play it played out. So his first point in uh, Snyder's article sounds like this, that Putin talked about different kingdoms in the past. He called them Russia, and he is now claiming that these lands are belonging to Russia, to the country that he is ruling now. So in Putin's logic, any political leader today can express unlimited number of accusations to their neighbors with the goal of reviewing the border relying on different historic interpretations of the past, which was done, for example, by the ex-Mongol president, who now joked that the whole territory of Russia belongs to him. And Snyder says that this is problematizing the existing world order that is founded on the legal borders between sovereign states. Now let me role-play, cosplay Putin here. Right, that because there was one of my main objections to his speech that all the borders in the world are artificial. All right, let's take a dictionary and take a look at what's legal and what's sovereign. The meaning of sovereign government appeared and started to strengthen in 1648 as a result of the bloodiest 30-year war and ongoing religious wars in Europe between Protestants and Catholics. And at the end it was set because everybody was so tired to fight that let's figure out how to agree. And they agreed. Who is the Duke? Uh, he's the one who is bringing the faith. And that's, in my opinion, where a lot of problems started in Europe, because in this moment faith became one of the attributes of throne of the civic power. And I'm here speaking from the faith of uh, Putin, I guess, in this case. And in this case, we, Russian Federation, whatever he's gathering now, or who's, we denounce the meaning of sovereignty that was set in 1648. We disagree with that, we have a different point of view on these things. Second, so-called legal borders automatically become legal in our eyes, because what is law? Law is the right of the victors, and we are here, and we started the 24th of February, or maybe earlier, on the 8th of August in 2008, or maybe even earlier that, than that, to review the right of victors, because the results of uh, 1991, those borders, we do not agree with. Look into my eyes, Tucker, listen to me, he should have said, right, the, the mafia moment. And we denounce that type of sovereignty, and we do not consider these borders to be legal. Right, this was one of the main messages that uh, one could read between the lines. But he was shy to say that in the open. And that question that uh, people were asking that most leaders are not calling war, war today, 
and they're um, shying from calling war as a part of human existence. But moreover, in all times, aggression and dominance were usually considered to be positive qualities for humanity, starting with the times when small 70 kilo humans were winning over 500 kilos cats and bears. But ever since everybody started shying away from these attributes, there are still a lot of wars in the world, but there is the same shitan amount of different names for them. Humanitarian intervention, Western invention, special military operation, Russian invention, anti-terrorist operation, Ukrainian in invention. But nobody can pronounce the word war. But by the way, the war becomes wilder because of that. Very well noticed by Sigmund Freud. The moment you push something out of your consciousness, at least on the word-forming level, and after that there is a meaning level, it goes into subconsciousness and collective subconsciousness and goes through a rapid regression. And modern wars are related with loss of ethics in wars. And I think they are related dire directly, that uh, degradation related directly to us not being able to call wars wars. And so if Putin would have said that this is what we're doing, this would be an imperial stomping, imperial march, in a way, the voice of that historic leader that he is uh, trying to present himself as. And while well, I'm cosplaying it here, that indeed could have been heard by peoples around the world. Otherwise, the swing is serious. And if you read uh, Russian Telegram and other channels to the videos, you can see that they're already starting expansion into the neighboring galaxies from Kremlin. But on camera, he is afraid to say what does he really want. And it's still a big question. Does he really think that? Does he really want that then? So half measures. Now let's go further. Snyder says Putin gives different dates to give different claims. Anybody can do that in relation to any territory. That is why I'm, and I'm translating from Ukrainian here, I have carried a copy. That means that not a single border is objective, including the borders of your own country. Everything is open for capture because everybody can have his own history, right? So Putin should have said exactly that. That's our position. None of the borders are legal for us and we will be using our force, our nuclear shield, and desire to review these borders because we, as a collective Russian Federation, think that this is very unjust, the current state of things. We started reviewing that and we are ready to die for that. Are you ready to die? If not, let's sit down and discuss. If you are, let's see who's stronger. Now let's go further. Second problem, he says, is genocide. After you've decided that the country deep in the past is to some degree your country now in the present, then you draw the story that supports your view on these things. The experience of people who lived in the past and those who lived in today is artificial, using one of the words that Putin often uses. In the interview, as in the other speeches during this war, he relies on a false division between natural and artificial nations. He is saying that artificial nations have no right to exist, and natural ones, they do. Uh, Snyder remarks that there is no difference. All nations are created, there are no natural nations. And Russia of tomorrow is being created by the actions of Russians today. If they are conducting an illegal war on uh, the territory of Ukraine, killing their neighbors, that makes them a different nation from what they would have been otherwise. And this is more important than whatever happened a hundred years ago. And if the nation is being called artificial, this is justifying genocide. And genocide does not change the past. You know, I do love the fairy tales of leftists who think that they can conjure the world by using the right words. So what Snyder is saying, translating that into human language, nation is an artificial construct. But Putin is not using the word nation. Putin is using the word people. And there is a huge difference, in my opinion, between nation and people. Nation doesn't exist, really. It's a construct of the epoch of modernity. And they probably... It, this, this epoch has maybe a dozen years left to live. These are the wars happening now that are changing it. And Putin is somewhat basing on crypto-Orthodox Christianity positions. And he should 
quote the Bible, the source, that people will come to bow. You should use the word people, because people, according to the doctrine, will exist to the second coming of Christ. And there are no nations there. And that's what he could have said to Snyder, that there is a single Russian people. Or here, I again, my personal opinion here, I think Putin is wrong. There are Russian people, there are Belarus people, and there are Ukrainian people. They really exist. There is culture, language, traditions that differ from each other. That for a historically long period of time constituted Russian civilization. Not Russian world, this is a different story. But Russian civilization that was united by the same religion they adopted from Byzantine Empire and the logic of uh, cohabitation. But since it is uh, principally not ethnic agglomeration, then anybody, Chechen, Yakut, American, has a potentiality to join the civilization and belong to it, just like any Muslim can join the civilization of Muslim, of Islam. And uh, Judaism, same story, a little more difficult, but similar. So this is what he should have outlined, and he should have then said that they're fighting for people, and that's what the war is about. But another point on those who do not fit into the nice concocted Putin story that Russia is eternal, they should be stricken out first from the narratives of the past and then from those who are considered to be people today, humans today. So if there are people who do not join that bandwagon, they need to be destroyed. This was the logic of his mass murders in Ukraine from the beginning. He was thinking that Ukraine will fall in a few days, he just needs to remove a few of them from the elites and then the Ukraine will fall. But the more Ukrainians stood for their country, the more grew the scope for the destruction and murder. This is also highlighted by the fact that uh, all the villages, all the towns where Russian troops invade, they destroy Ukrainian schools and burn Ukrainian books, and this is true. A lot of people already said that Ukrainians, those who are fighting and defending their country, they're fighting also for that part of self-identification that is being brutally destroyed. Snyder outlines the actual reality. When they came to Ukraine, they actually had the lists whom needs to be killed. Were all, were all the activists who ever, ever produced any sympathy for Ukraine, for Ukrainian idea, the veterans of military, their relatives, and all those cleansings that they've done on the occupied territories were the biggest idiots here on behalf of Putin. If uh, he really wanted to join Ukraine, I'll be a devil's advocate here. He should have said that this was the hugest mistake of ours and uh, that he takes all responsibility for it. And those people who are doing genocide will be found and punished or were creating military crimes, they will get punishment. And that he personally will do a lot to prevent that, that this was a mistake. Alexei, can I interject here, actually add more like it? Because it would have been actually good if he stopped treating Ukrainian soldiers as criminals who had uh, created some uprising against his reign, if he treated them with, like noble warriors they are, that they deserve. Right, if uh, you look at the stance of uh, what our soldiers come back in, this doesn't look like an empire, this looks like dirty rats in the basement, those goons in Russia who are doing that and who are commanding them. This is not imperial march, Putin. You pretend to be some new emperor or some holder of new civilization. Empires don't treat prisoners like that, prisoners of war like that. Empires used to carry greatness and nobility uh, of intentions and relations with the enemies. I would outline here that Peter the Great, he actually put Swedes at the table and he talked to them, he respected them, he did not starve them, he did not bring them to Alenovka and blow them up. 
he did not starve them that when they are 220 to 150 pounds, but they get to the court at about 110. So that would be an emperor who would be supporting and treating his enemies accordingly, but not what Putin is doing. Oh yeah, I want to add here that when Imam Shamil, when he was captured by Russian Empire, he was living in good quarters and uh, he was well fed, well kept. He was even visiting Oprah in his uh, prison times and uh, he was shocked by the singers not being fully dressed. But yeah, he had a government pension and his son was, was brought up in the Russian Imperial Military School and eventually led the guards of uh, the Tsar, of the next Tsar. No, yeah, that's the other one. Um, the other son returned back to his father, and as a result of Russian military failures, um, he had a chance to return home, and he looked at the towns of his country after living in the imperial St. Petersburg and looking at the civilization there. Um, he actually looked around and then soon he dwindled and died from despair, as they say, because he totally saw the difference between the one civilization and the other. Well, right, but some other uh, relatives still remained and they actually served in the Tsar's uh, bodyguards regiment. So, Empire was always bringing some civilization and some light to its neighbors. What Putin is doing, he's bringing death. So he's got the visage of an empire that he's following, but he definitely is failing in terms of what empires bring to the world. So if he is to be schooled, he should have said that we do not have anything against Ukrainian culture and we welcome Ukrainian people. And to prove that, I'm opening 300 Ukrainian language schools in Russia. I'm opening Ukrainian library, printing, an anthology of Ukrainian authors opening the faculty of Ukrainian philology in the Moscow University, in Novosibirsk University, where they study Skovarada, Lesya Ukrainka, and uh, Kirill Mifodia Brotherhood. But Ukraine as a political project do not satisfy me, so under denazification we mean the liquidation of current Ukrainian political project that is built on the terms of being anti-Russian. We have nothing against Ukraine as a separate political entity that promises to never threaten or attack Russia, but otherwise we think they are part of one big people, however he would, uh, in this case, would have phrased. That would have been a different story. He would have been a, in a stronger position, not only in relation to his people, but to other people that border Russia and that live in Russia because right now in Russia they are fighting who is the real Tatar and who is the real Russian. This is from lack of mastery of doing national politics within the already existing Russian Federation that has 86 subjects and about 300 different peoples in them. And that's where it stems from. Current Kremlin cannot read the dictionary and cannot understand their goals as they somehow declare them. They should have said that they uh, they should have acknowledged the existence of Ukrainian people, perhaps even he should have even quoted some poem in Ukrainian. He should have hi highlighted that he separates Ukrainian culture from Ukrainian political project and even would not mind a Ukrainian political project if it was not aimed against Russia as a Tsar of, or, or the Emperor of Russia. And that's what he would be sending a message about, with a request to not threaten Russia. And then we can discuss the list of threats and the ways to negotiate for that. But since Ukraine did not want to address that, I started that war. And the end result of this war is not destruction then, in this case, destruction of Ukrainian people, and not destruction of Ukraine as a political construct, but a destruction of Ukraine as the political construct designed to counter, to be against Russian Federation. But for that, in order to be that effective, one would need to do a lot. He would need to have figured out who is burning Ukrainian books, who is trampling and burning Ukrainian flags, 
who is destroying the monuments of Ukrainian culture and start punishing them publicly for the violation of the rules of war. That uh, should have matched the decency as he perceives the Russian soldier. That is pretty straightforward. But are they capable of this in their current condition? No. Unfortunately, no. But I cannot, I can say here, Alexei, that those people who are burning Ukrainian books are the ones who are imprisoning their own political activists in Russia, like Karam Murza, for 20 years. Of course, this is a psychotype that has prevailed under Putin's regime. And however, they try to mimic the empire, they are nothing close to it. And I'm just doing a little school for the emperor, how to be an empire, how to be a proper empire. Third problem, fascism manifested as objectivity. Putin is one of the biggest dictators in the world. He personally controls hundreds of billions of dollars. And yet he is a long-term victim of everybody around him. And Ukrainians are aggressors because they disagree with Putin's view. Putin says that Ukrainians are Nazis. This word in his mouth means that these people refuse to acknowledge that Russians are pure to match the Putin's vision, whatever Putin does. And this serves as justification to start war, to having stolen tens of thousands of children, to kill a lot of people. With all that, his Russia still remains a victim who has a full right to do whatever they do. And here is the topic that you started, where Putin presents himself as a victim. We've been cheated, we've been promised that NATO would not be expanding, we were deceived. We wanted peace with Ukraine, they failed to go through, and we've been deceived many, many times. A true emperor can say that only once, that the empire was deceived once. And after that, what does it have to do? After that, it needs to make sure it is not wrong, right? As one my pal said, you should never be upset at other people, you should be upsetting them. And Suvorov, uh, the military general of uh, imperial times, said, always hit, never defend. So the emperor can say, we have been deceived by these people at that time, and these are the grievances. And like historical phrase, right, I'll send a million viewers in gray uniforms who will watch that play. And then you present an ultimatum, you voluntarily give up those people who deceived us, review those issues that we have, and you guys provide a compensation for this. And then a million viewers will not come to your territory, to your capital, to watch the show. And if you refuse to do that, then they do walk across the border that you think is legal, and God save you in your Paris's, Berlin's, Washington's. That's the word of an emperor, right? The empire can be deceived only once. And after that, it will come and ask. And when this is a list of grievances and complaints, and we are poor and humble, then one wants to ask, okay, if you are being regularly deceived, what's wrong with you? Do you want to be deceived? And in Putin's case, that's exactly what's happening. He, unfortunately, is still somewhat the most pro-Western rulers of Russia in the 20th century and uh, 21st now, but he wants really to be accepted as equal on the West. And uh, yet they behave as the people, and his whole, whole group, his whole group of cronies, behave as uh, petty tyrants who want to exert revenge on the neighboring country. And yet they claim that Ukraine is the same people. Well, if you are saying that they're the same people, then find a way to acknowledge that. Why do you destroy Ukrainian schools? Why do you trample on Ukrainian books, break the monuments to Shevchenko, and so on? What is that about? Well, in Russia, by the way, you still have streets, Shevchenko streets, and monuments to Shevchenko, and yet you're breaking them in Ukraine. This is not an empire, this is a drunken fighter in a, in a pub, a drunken peasant fighting in a pub. 
Empires do not behave like that. Those countries who even aspire to be empires don't behave like that. And the country that sets meta framework and pretends to have some meta historic meaning in the world civilization, uh, they don't behave like that. So, continuing with Snyder's points, Russia is always right, those against Russia are always wrong. Russians can behave as Nazis, calling the others Nazis, and everything will be all right, in their view. The war is being done with fascist methods, mass propaganda, mass mobilization, mass murder. These are some of the signs of Nazism and fascism. And it's not even brought with any framework. He just says that, that's his opinion, but he says that and believes that. And it's based on the inner politics and separation between us and them. And it's based on the international propaganda campaign that they abuse and they just use the dictionary to call names on everybody around them. Here, by the way, Snyder, being a lefty, uh, finds himself among the culprits because, yeah, being a lefty, they, they always think that the world can be contrary to other words. And he is saying, rightly so, I think, that Ukraine has a lot more problems, uh, fewer problems with ultra-right than Russia, United States or any other European country that you can bring. Ukrainians elected a Jew as a president, an ethnic Jew, with an overwhelming majority. That was not an issue. But if there were Nazis, that would have been an issue, right? Minister of Defense is a Tatarian and Muslim, is a Tatar and Muslim. And, uh, Commander-in-Chief is actually Russian, ethnic Russian, who was born in Russia, who has relatives in Russia. So Ukraine manages to maintain some diversity, even at times of war, that, uh, okay, then he bows to Ukraine. So proper emperor should have said that our demand is denazification, so you either ban those ultra-right parties that you have registered, or we come for them, and then you will suffer. But uh, even after we have arrived, you should have behaved as if you are actually looking for those Nazis and not when you are executing population, civilians, you torture teens, you kill women, and you shoot with guided or semi-guided and semi-precise missiles at the Ukrainian cities. That's what the Empire should have done, that's not what Russia is doing. This is why Ukrainians are resisting, will be resisting, and will prevail in some fashion eventually. If Russia was a proper empire, there would not be a war, first of all. Regardless of how stupid Ukraine behaved, they would have found other ways to achieve their goals without engaging in military conflict. And then they would have found a way to achieve their goals. And even I'm not even going into the tactical steps there, but just looking at the position that Putin declared he wants, those uh, positions are achievable without conducting, essentially, as he said, civilian civil war, right? Because just losses in Mariupol, how many civilians were killed in that city when they, where they were catching that uh, Nazi Azov battalion? I don't even know, like say, I keep seeing different numbers. Right, the current estimations are between 25,000 and 125,000 lost civilians. Azov battalion at that time was maybe 3,000 at, at large. Even if you take the smallest gauge of that, of 25,000 casualties, you kill 25,000 people to catch three? This is just madness, right? Who does it? So, personally, I think that his thesis about denazification is a rather stupid endeavor because he totally goes bonkers when he starts talking about that. My biggest objection to his worldview is in that, okay, Vlad, you're saying that these are Russian lands, then why all these people do not want to live with Russia? All of them. What have you done? Maybe look in the mirror. Perhaps if you had set a proper economy and a proper society in the country, don't even need to be democratic, okay, if we're talking about an empire, right? But just flourishing society like maybe China. By the way, historical Russia, it was, if not a part of Europe, a Russian culture. 
was definitely based on the European culture. And the whole societal structure was based on Europe, European society. And uh, it, it was called empire, so it was a copy. They were trying to copy Roman Empire. So all the routes, they go to the West, to Europe. So if he continued to stay with the pro-Western politics, not in terms of creating gender-neutral bathrooms, but the West that existed in the 19th century. Perhaps uh, the other countries would not be running away. Yulia, let's hit them with their own weapons. This is the best way in polemics, in discussion. If they are fighting for the Holy Russia, and Holy Russia is a civilization of truth and conscience, so if he would be building a country that rely on truth and conscience, then half of the globe would want, would dire, to join it. That lacks so much in these two meanings. Oh, like say, to hell with truth and conscience, as long as they just had a good economic situation, that would be attractive enough for many of them. Um, I want to say that a lot of uh, my acquaintances and friends in the United States, some of them from deep state, they are emigrating to Switzerland and to Europe, to some parts of Europe at the end of their lives, because they don't see America going in the right direction. They're upsetting with it. They're being upset with current trends. And so in his logic, we are the holy Russia. We are the civilization of truth. We do not accept your Western perversions. We don't like it and we are very different. If he indeed did do that, and indeed build the country like that, then probably a half of Ukraine would have joined their ranks. I can guarantee that. Just like a lot of Ukrainians were still working on the Russian construction sites up until the 22, even after the events of 2014. There were millions of them working there. There were not one, not two, thousands of cases when those who fought in anti-terrorist operation in Ukraine went in the suburbs of Moscow to do the construction work. And many of them made good money there because economically it was all right and it was uh, rather acceptable. But after what he started in February, in his good conscience, a normal man would not want to join the country that created a torture room in Kherson for 14-year-old teens. A normal person cannot join that side. You can be triple Orthodox, triple Russian, but you cannot join that madness. Or to those who destroy Mariupol like that, who leveled the whole city, or who tortures prisoners of war to that state. Well, first of all, prisoners of war, they are not to be presented to any court during the war times. And this is the international law. We, just, we agreed to not appeal to that today, right? But this is not done. This is not practical. This is not a practice. You can kill an enemy, you can keep an enemy prisoner, but you do not keep, get an enemy as a prisoner and then create the kangaroo court in your country trying to execute them. And even uh, that Nuremberg trial, by the way, after the Second World War, had some issues, right? Because those who were essentially victims of uh, Hitler's aggression, they were jury and uh, jurors. So there were some legal issues with that. But putting that aside, in the heads of current Russian leadership, they have a huge mix of post-modernity eclectics. And they're mixing everything there. And they're mixing Orthodox Christianity in, but nothing they're doing reminds of that. However many cathedrals they built in Russia, and however many right words you say, you either are or you are not. But they behave themselves as semi-fascist, very low-grade, very post-modernity, dependent on the West, and wanting to be accepted by the West substructure, a structure, substructure of vision on the world. This is so far from the goals that are officially being stated, from Holy Russia, from Russian Empire, from uh, Russian state, 
There is an old truth from children's psychology, one well-known kid's uh, psychologist said, Vladimir Levy, if you know. He was saying that any attempt to fix the kids without fixing their own conscience as a parent is deemed to fail. So when you come with 600,000 troops to change the country that you don't like, and you say they've been they upset you, you first probably had to fix your brains, your mind, and then come. Or at least try to fix that, try to fix your say, your issues first. And as Christ taught people, you will learn them, you will see them by their deeds. And uh, basements with executed people in Bucha, this is definitely not a great civilization, and not a civilization of righteousness, light, and meaning, which uh, that Holy Rus is supposed to mean. That's why I'm saying, I'm Russian. I've chosen to belong to that civilization. Ethnically, I'm a mix of Belarus, Pole, and Russian. My mom is Russian. But I've chosen to belong to Rus civilization because I do like truth, I like conscience, I like justice, light, and happiness. I do not like modernity, I do not like disciplinary society, and with pleasure I am observing the end of modernity. But what Putin is doing now should not be given up, given out to public or presented to public as that Rus civilization. The swing is for the dollar and the hit is for the cent, and that's a bloody cent with blood of those kids that were murdered while you were trying to bring your great civilization here. So, while they are not matching themselves, the history will be teaching them, and will be teaching them rather harshly. And the great civilization that takes four months to aggregate troops to take a regional center, uh, and then tries to threaten Washington, Paris, and others, this is not a great civilization, despite all, all the 40,000 volunteers that come to their draft points, etc. Well, Alexei, I have to note here that Berlin is probably easier to be to take than Avdiivka. Well, yeah, I think Medinsky back in the March of 22 gave us a compliment. Uh, he was at the negotiations at that time, and uh, I remember him saying that let's remove these uh, parameters from our asks and let's start with some praise to Ukrainian side. You guys actually are fighting fantastically. And why? Because we're the same people. Only we can fight like that. Let's join together and show the West, or at least do not fight with each other, this is madness. And that's what they were saying in March of 22. Let's urgently come to agreement. By the way, Putin is still pushing for that. His main message in his speech, let's come to agreement. All right, wait, wait. So, if they were praising Ukrainian defense forces in private conversations, the ones that they keep in cages, what prevented them from doing that on a federal level? Exactly, that's what I'm talking about. Russian propaganda, like in the Iliad. Look, Hector is so cool. Um, remember how, Put how Putin ended his speech? There was an episode when he said Ukrainians were surrounded and they said Russians never surrender. So we are same people. Well, here's a question. Why on earth are you torturing then your own people in prison? Because it's horrible when you see this is over coming a lot of the milestones left by Nazis of uh, Hitler Germany back in the day. What Russians, what light and truth? Even when you're dealing with total enemies who would be saying, objecting to your own exist, to your real existence, you should not be behaving like that. Nazis did not behave like that. They did not torture prisoners of war like that. They let correspondence to them, they gave them word, they published some of their statements. So, what are you bringing the 23-year-old soldiers to, that they're walking skeletons? And then you come out and say that we're the same people, and they're just like our soldiers. Again, back to Christ, you will learn them by their deeds. If you are saying one thing and doing other, you are wolves coming in sheepskin. And the tree that doesn't give fruit will wither, as uh, the Christ said. 
Oh, it'll be chopped off, right. <laughs> exactly. Well, it was the proverb that he brought in, right? If you're calling yourself a fruit tree, you should be bearing fruit. And if you're not, then you have a different destiny. That's why I do like to read in the commentary, Arestovich, you're Russian, switch to our side. What are you doing there with Ukrainians? Just apologize and come back. I always want to ask, what do you want me to apologize for? I'm Russian in Ukraine. This is a hundred times more difficult than being Russian in your Putin's Russia. I think you should apologize because you're calling yourselves Russians, but you're behaving like some dumpster rats. Rats with nukes, but still rats. When you will start to behave like Russians, that's when the war will be over and we'll find a common language rather quickly. But you are not. And I cannot be talking to rats. When you will punish all the military criminals on Russia, when our prisoners of war will be well fed, when they'll be returned to their mothers as a gesture of goodwill, we'll give you back yours. That's when it will look like you started to understand something. Until then, no. You know, I think it was General Rochlin who was removed from command of detachment in Afghanistan. I think it was him back in the 90s when somewhere in uh, Azerbaijan, Armenia, part of the world, people were trying to storm the military facility and steal weapons and all. And they said, we'll bring, we'll put women in front, women and children, and you don't shoot them. And then we get in and we still take our arms because you won't shoot at women. What will you do? And he said, oh, we'll find a way to find you after and to kill you all. And the storm of the military uh, camp failed, or was cancelled. So that's what I'm saying. The empire finds ways, often finds ways to deal with things without waging war. What are you doing? You're not Russians. You're so far removed from real Russians as walking backwards to Beijing from Europe. And you have a courage to call yourself Russian world, Russian civilization. How about you first learn to behave yourself? Just like people at first, not even as the empire of light and conscience and truth. You're not worthy of Russian footwear. You have to be trying for centuries to become ones. And this is the end of part one. We'll continue. There is another 45 minutes in the stream. Thank you.